All right, good afternoon, everybody. Wall Street Jesus Tuesday post game show. We'll talk a little market here. Um, basically, I'll give you an idea. We're open. This is not just a web uh, members only. All right. So uh, welcome everybody, by the way, who's not a member. Um, so if anybody has any questions, if I start to use too much of the uh, member lingo, uh, feel free to ask at any given point in time. But um, basically, we'll talk uh, briefly about where we're likely set up going into manana um, based off action and sentiment. And um, a couple of things to look for, you know, a couple of things we've seen, a couple of things we haven't, um, and things to keep an eye on uh, going forward here, okay? And we can look at some of the action today, uh, not a whole lot of it, uh, not much at all, to be quite honest, uh, but we'll look at uh, the order flow anyway, and this way, maybe you guys see something you may be interested in. Let me post it onto private Twitter so I could go there. Hold on. All right. Hey, top bets. All right, very good. All right, so basically, um, those of you who have been on this webinar, obviously, if you're members, um, you know the playbook. We've been trying to drill in our heads here uh, since this corrective phase has started. A um, couple months back. How long are we in this thing right now? Let's see. So we started a little before October, right? Yeah, time flies when you're having fun here. Um, but basically the playbook sounds, well, it comes across easy, but it's difficult to stay disciplined and, and put into action. Okay, uh, we spoke about this. If you remember on the last webinar, um, I got tattooed with questions. And don't get me, there's no such thing as a bad question. So I don't want you to get that impression. Uh, but I all, often get the question, uh, what happens if it doesn't work? You know, with any edge out there, that's what a, a lot of retail traders, they look for. They look for the one time that something may not work instead of focusing on all the other times that it was successful, okay? And last week, if you guys remember it, I got several questions on what happens if you, you got sentiment showing extreme bearish uh, readings and you got some sweeper activity and the market doesn't bounce, okay? And, you know, it is what it is. It's a loser. You're going to find that no matter what you do come across throughout your career in this game. Um, but you don't have to take my word for it. You can ask members who have been following this, you know, long enough. We've got uh, quite a few people that have been, um, you know, with me aboard since day one. And they can vouch that more than not, a lot more than not. Okay, and that's an understatement. Uh, when you got the retail crowd bearish, position bearish, and the professional crowd start to take the other side, you usually get a tradable event. Okay, and that's pretty much um, the playbook in this type of environment, whether you like it or not. Okay, you can complain about the volatility. You can complain about the algos. You can complain about the market. You can complain about the Fed till you turn purple in the face. It's not going to put any money in your pocket. The likelihood is it's going to take money out of your pocket, okay? So face the facts. One of the most important facets of this game is to deal with the hand you were dealt from the market gods, okay? And right now, from my experience, over the years, the only way to play this animal is by that playbook, okay? You guys may have other strategies. That's all fine and great. I'm not here to uh, try to prove your strategies wrong. I'm sure there are several, many other strategies that work 
in each and every environment, okay? Um, but obviously, this webinar, I'm here to share with you, you know, the stuff that I've discovered over the course of my career and what works in different market environments. And that, that's the main playbook, okay? So in simple English, those of you who have been on the webinar, those of you who are members know exactly what I'm talking about. But if you're new, just briefly, we had a similar setup to what I'm describing to you, okay, into the flush yesterday, all right? So meaning that we came in yesterday into the opening bell, right? So we came into the morning yesterday knowing that the retail crowd was bearish at an extreme, okay? The short-term trader money from retail traders, the speculative money, was positioned for more downside, okay? So we came in yesterday looking for some signs from the professional money that they were going to flip to the other side, okay? They were positioning for a squeeze. And what we got, and there's two ways, especially in this environment, there are two ways that flow, that type of buying can come in. All right. One way would be, you know, the market's been destroyed here. A lot of professional money on the sidelines. They've been waiting for an opportunity to do some real buying. They come in guns blazing when you least expect it and they start bombing things, right? A la Bazooka Joe, as we like to say, all right? Meaning you see a million dollar sweeps all over the yard. And the reason why um, you would see that, okay, and in such a big, mag large magnitude is because exactly what I just finished saying, that a lot of the professional money is has been moving to the sidelines and waiting for this market to reprice. And when they feel it's at a level where we should have at least a sustainable bottom, not a bottom that lasts a day or a week, but a bottom possibly that lasts a couple, you know, several months, if not the start of a new leg of a rally. And they're going to come in and put a lot of money to work because when they got a lot of cash, um, that's been raised over the course of this correction. And there are a lot of bargains out there, okay? Obviously, there's been a whole reset in this market thanks to this correction. And there are names trading at levels, you know, three months ago, you would never throw it in a million years, you would see them, okay? So that's one type of buying. That's the buying we all would love to see. Okay, that's the buying that we get really, really excited about. But a lot of times what happens is, in again, in the corrective phase, not every bottom is the bottom. Okay, you have tradable bottoms, right? And you see over the course of a correction, you see flush, the selling dries up, some buying comes in, squeeze. Flush, selling dries up, bigger squeeze, right? So you see over the course, this is a correction, a downtrend, but it's not straight down. And I think that's where a lot of retail money, um, I guarantee you, is finding a tough time right now. Because they thought, oh, once we get into a bearish market, a bearish environment, I'm just going to short the shit out of everything every day, excuse my French, and make money. And right now, especially right now, um, even the shorts are having a tough time, okay, because of the volatility, right? Net-net, we're lower from A to Z, but the in-between, sitting through these type of rallies is a lot easier said than done, let alone sitting through a two-day rally, let alone something like this, okay? So what a lot, So rather than... The first example I gave to you where just the institution, the professional money just dives in and starts buying everything they possibly can get their hands on. Another form of buying that could come in is what I like to, I have labeled um, over the years, squeeze flow, okay? And 
Simply put, that type of activity, that type of buying is a little different because they're playing for just one thing. They're positioning for just one thing. And that's an oversold short squeeze. Sometimes it lasts a couple of days. Sometimes they're huge. It lasts a day. Okay. Um, but the most important thing to understand about that type of buying is that it's usually short lived. Okay. Cause what they're doing is they come in, they start, they, they play in weeklies. They play mostly ETFs. Why? Because they're not, they don't want to get involved in individual names. If they're playing for a squeeze, we talked about this several times amongst us, right? If you want to be sure about capitalizing on a squeeze, the likelihood is your better your best bet to play an ETF, you know, SPY, ES, Qs, whatever it may be, because an individual name, you can run into a downgrade that next morning. And that stock may not participate in the rally. Okay, so when they're coming in to play just for a sentiment squeeze, okay, that squeeze flow, they're coming in based on sentiment and oversold conditions, and they're looking just for a quick rally. Again, can be powerful, but it's usually short dated. All right. And that's exactly what we just saw here. Okay, yesterday we didn't see, and you guys are, who are members and gals who are members know exactly what I'm talking about because we discussed it throughout the day. We didn't see them coming guns blazing, firing off, firing off a million dollar sweeps in a bunch of beaten down blue chippers. Okay, they came in, they bought what? Spy weeklies, Facebook weeklies. Twitter weeklies, QQQ, right? Everything short dated. Some were decent size, especially in the in the ETFs. But in individual names, the better looking action was in ETFs. And for me, that's always been a top sign that it's squeeze flow based off sentiment. Okay. So yesterday we had that powerful reversal. Okay, so red to green, and then today you had a follow-through gap up, um, eventually ran out of gas, all right? You know, where's the upside end? You know, if I had that information, I wouldn't be talking to you guys. You know, obviously nobody knows that. Nobody knows how long a squeeze can go on for, you know? It, depending on how many people caught short, who's capitulating, blah, 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 okay, but... Again, like I said, it's usually short dated, and this would qualify, in my opinion, as that, exactly that, sentiment squeeze, okay? So now going forward, nothing changes, and I see a lot of traders, you know, today, see, we, and this is the problem, this is a perfect example. We go over this, especially, you know, with members, okay, and I know it's difficult because I'm 20 years in the game and I still need reminders, all these indicators and readings to remind me to do what I need to do. Okay, so I understand it. But, you know, we go over this ad nauseum and lo and behold, this morning into a gap up, what are traders doing? Instead of locking in profit, not not all. There were a lot of a lot of members locking in profit. But I'm saying there's a good number of traders on the retail side buying into the gap up. Okay, and that's the last thing you want to do is buy into that gap up after that squeeze. No matter what, you missed it, you missed it. The last thing you want to do in this type of environment is chase the gap up after a move like that, without the quality flow behind it, especially. Okay, it's one thing if we were seeing quality action across the board in individual names signaling to us that maybe these guys are trying to nail out a bottom, all right? And you say to yourself, you know what? I'm going to buy some stuff here, 
even if there's a pullback, I'm willing to add, and so on. Okay, but for a squeeze type flow um, off sentiment, you really, the last thing you want to do, unless you're scalping, intraday trading, is chase that green. Okay, the playbook right now stays the same going forward, and that playbook is, there's only two options here. Okay, it's, there's no, it's pretty simple. You got to keep it simple. There's no other route that, that we can go here. It's either they set it up all over for uh, all over again for us based off sentiment. Okay. So that would mean that all the negativity, all the bearishness that got squeezed out finds a way to come back in here and is betting on that leg to the downside. Okay. And then we're keeping our eyes on the flow for signs that the professional money is going to take the other side. Okay. Or, and what it, what can happen is they come earlier than that sentiment signal, like we were talking about last week. We don't need bullish sentiment. If they come in tomorrow, let's say we have red, okay, and we start seeing million-dollar sweeps in several different names, and you guys know what flow I'm talking about. It's obvious. There's no, you're not questioning it when it comes in. And think of it logically. Think about the big money on the sidelines waiting for that entry right now. They cannot hide when they're ready to go. They can't hide it. That's the beauty of flow. They cannot hide it. Okay? So if we see that activity start to come in and they're buying things aggressively and you know, sentiments at where it is. I think we closed right around neutral, maybe a little less than that today. Even if sentiment's there, we still need to be ready to fire. That changes the whole playbook. Okay, that's what we're waiting for, obviously. That's what we all want to see, right? So that's it. I know, I know it may come across as too simple, but that's it. Everything that we look at every single day in the steam room and on private Twitter, that's what it all comes down to. All right? We're looking for trades. In other words, we're looking for a way to make some money and survive this downturn. And that's going to be based off extreme bearish sentiment where some squeeze sweepers take action and we catch a rip. And then lo and behold, there's going to be a point in time when the big guys come in and we want to be ready. We we want the ammo ready to fire, right? We want the guns loaded to fire. We want our eyes open and paying attention um, and being ready to uh, take advantage of that. All right. Does it make sense? I mean, anybody have, again, I'm talking to members here and uh, non-members, so it may sound foreign to some of you non-members. I know um, uh, most of you who have been members can relate to exactly uh, what I'm talking about here. But that's it. Everything you guys see me post, um, even on private Twitter, after the bell, and pre-market, and even throughout the day, is just to give us all a heads up on where this stuff lands what are you know what sweeper activity telling us and what the hell is the riffraff doing the retail crowd doing that's what it's all about you know and the, and the best the best situations come about when they both line up okay and in bull markets you don't need both lining up as a lot of you know okay when you're in an uptrend you don't need the retail crowd to be bearish, okay? Because the likelihood is there's some decent flow out there. There's decent sweeper activity in new names, new setups. So we're not paying as much attention to retail sentiment out there, okay? But now, because of this environment and the climate we're in, you know, for me, over the years, this has been the only playbook. And if you look, even if you guys are not 
trading off it and you just keep your eyes open, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Okay? It's not a coincidence that every time they're leaning bearish, there's a squeeze right around the corner. And then once they squeeze these guys out, the, all of a sudden things go right back to where they were and the selling continues. And all in all, that's the volatility we see here. Anybody make sense? Anybody have any questions? Um, even you guys who are members or new members, anybody have any questions regarding any of this stuff? Uh, now would be the time to ask. Uh, no reason to, you know, look at this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis and have no clue of what I'm talking about. Simple enough, right? What I mean by playbook is that's the game plan, you know? That's what I mean by playbook. That's the game plan, my game plan of sweeper activity and sentiment to survive and find some success in this type of climate. Okay, so that means that a day like today, you're probably going to trade nothing. I didn't trade a thing. I didn't I didn't day trade anything. I sure have, as hell wasn't going to swing trade anything. Why? Because there was, the flow was abysmal. There wasn't one thing that caught my eye or impressed me out of the action. And the entry was yesterday into yesterday's flush. Not today into the green move. Again, today was the easier day to buy things, to get long, right? You had to squeeze yesterday. You had some green pre-market. Some stocks were looking healthy. Today was the easier day to get yourself to buy it, but that's usually, especially in this environment, that's usually the wrong time. You know, these, and sometimes they're different. Sometimes they're off, you know, people always ask, oh, well, sentiment moves so drastically this go around, or sentiment really didn't move this much. Because it's emotion, it's psychology. You know, you could probably get a feel of sentiment just off yourself. How you feel that particular day. If you're looking to go grab a fistful of calls into a gap up, you know exactly where sentiment is right now. And when you can't buy that uh, selling that's coming in, into the market, because you're pooping your bloomers, you know damn well where sentiment is. You know? So that's... Is that simple? It's that simple, Pablo. Okay, and here's the trick, though. Okay, the, there's complications like anything. This beast of a, the market's a beast that there's always complications. Okay, nothing. It doesn't always go according to plan. All right, and one of the biggest hurdles that I run into playing this way is with individual names. Okay, because what I've just explained to you, you could catch a squeeze and for some reason, that name that you decided to buy calls in is not squeezing, is not bouncing or not bouncing enough. And there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, you want to solve that problem completely? Make a bet on the overall market. Make a bet on the overall market. You know, but this is, this is, things are a little more volatile now, okay? And you hear it because of the machines. But even, you know, I remember even when I was trading before machines were a big deal that when you get into corrections, there's volatility, And considering the rally we've come off of, the bull market we've come off of, you know, considering 
all that pent up bullishness that came out of 2017 on the from the retail crowd? The volatility shouldn't surprise anybody. Now, don't get me wrong. It's a real pain in the rear end. And you may decide that the best thing to do is not get involved because things are too quick. But if you're going to go and call yourself a trader, which a lot of people do out there, I am a trader. This is a trading environment. Okay, getting long stocks in an uptrend, you don't need to be a trader. So the, you should look forward to the volatility if that's what you like to do. Okay, size down. Take some of the stress out. The moves are big enough. But if you're not around the computer all day long and it's not for you, there's no reason to be embarrassed about it. Like I said, you guys heard me say that. You're going to come to the crossroads at some point in this game when you realize you're not Jesse Livermore and Paul Tudor Jones, and you're going to have to do something that you're capable of doing to find success in this game. You know, if you're all trying to be uh, Mr. Super Trader out there, the odds are stacked against you. Nine out of ten of you aren't going to be able to do that. That's facts. All right, so you got to do what you got to do. If you can't take advantage of what I just explained to you, then my recommendation would be move to the sidelines and wait for the guns to come in blazing. Could be a while. Yeah, but Paul Tudor Jones and Livermore both got whacked in their career at, at points in their career. Livermore took his own life. God only knows why. And Paul Tudor Jones, you know, he took his share of beatings. But I'm just saying it's it, – if you think you're going to come into this game every day and and figure it out on the fly based off your instincts and your gut, the odds are not in your favor. You know, not in your favor. There's got to be, you know, something you're comfortable with, you know, something uh, a certain setup. Right? There's got to be something you're comfortable with that you've made money with that you have to allow to set up. And if you can't, that's where you run into the problem. And, you know, that's the biggest feedback, the most feedback I get from um, the sentiment setup. Okay? I get it a lot. I get, well, Jesus, you know, the sentiment man kept me so much out of trouble. I know it works. I know it's there. My problem is waiting. What do I do in the in-between? What do I do in the in-between? What do I do those days waiting for that setup? Right? That's the biggest, the most feedback I get from, you know, the stuff we look at every day. Now, what about if it takes, you know, two weeks for sediment to set up again? Yeah, that those two. What do I do in those two weeks to not lose money? So that's the yeah. That again, that's that's you guys know yourself better than I do. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, Stephen, I could go to the track and um, and it can replace this maybe if you're talking about that. But no, but Stephen's saying it's like going to the track. And not being able to place a bet. And Steven makes a great point on that note. And you guys know you heard me say it before. Okay. I grew up around professional gamblers. Okay. That's I that's my background in this game. 
I grew up around more professional gamblers than I or you guys thought even exist out there, right? Everyone put that gambling term like everyone's a degenerate gambler. And I was around, my father had a crowd that had successful gamblers that never worked a day in their life. And Stephen brings up a great point, okay? Stephen, I used to go with a guy who used to go every day dressed like the, he used to go to the racetrack dressed like the Mac Daddy. All right, like the Mac. He used to go to the racetrack, sit up with all the big shots, with his binoculars, eat a nice meal every day, and he'd go there and not bet a single race. He'd go there just for one race, one race where he had his edge. And I remember me and my father used to bug out. Like, he won't even go to the window and put a $5 bet for entertainment purposes only on a freaking race. You know what I mean? He didn't even want to do that. He would go every, he would go to the track every day, every day. Right. And my father used to bring me to the track with him every day. And my father was the total opposite. My father, there were 13 races on the card. He'd bet 14. And get walloped. And this dude just sat there each and every day for the one race that he eyed a week ago. But, you know, on that point, I mean, that's a perfect example, Stephen, right? That's a perfect example to what I'm talking about here. Exactly. Delonte, exactly. He knew his edge. He waited for it, right? He waited for the opportunity, and he he fired when uh, when it came about, and that, and that's what this is, you know. And Delonte, that's the point I try to make to a lot of people, and a lot of people don't understand it because maybe they don't have that gambler background. And I guess I'm, you know, I expect people to understand it, but that's what I mean about. You're going to come to the crossroads in this in this game and realize that. You're either going to strive to be that superstar Jesse Livermore idolizing trader, right? That you could trade anything from Bitcoin to hog to wheat to stocks, okay? Eventually, you're going to lose enough money. Most More than likely, you're going to lose enough money to the point where you say to yourself, all right, I got to just play my edge in what I have confidence in, what I know I can make more money more times than not, and wait for that op- wait for those opportunities, or continue to strive to be that trader because I'm determined and end up out of the game. But you're going to you're going to you're going to confront that at some point in your career, I promise you. And a lot of the traders that I know. Again, I could just tell you that I know. They were lucky enough to confront that early on to avoid getting shellacked and knocked out of the game. You know, but that's, again, I could just share what, you know, the guys I've been around, uh, the type of crowd I've been around in this game. You know, a lot of people, especially on social media, that paint these stories about this game. Uh, just work hard and, you know, read those books. And, oh, yeah, just read that. What's that one book? There's one book every trader in the world reads. And they think like they're reading the Bible. And all of a sudden they'll be able to uh, trade in. Now Livermore, you guys know. It's a good book, actually. I'm drawing a blank now. What's the one book you guys would recommend to a trader based off price action? You guys know what I'm talking about. Mm Mm-hmm. That's it. Trading in the zone. Who was that again? That's the one. That's the one. I think that's the one. Trading in the zone. So, yeah. And, you know, the, the, the problem with this market Uh, Mark Douglas, I think that's it. 
the the problem <laughs> beat the dealer. The problem with this game is that we're we're wired as human beings the wrong way. You know what I mean? We're just wired the wrong way to be successful at this game. Yeah, Jack Swagger. I think that's it. Or is it Mark Douglas? One of those books. But you get the point. You know, my point being, no matter how much homework you do, and no matter what type of determination and persistence you may have, you may not want to hear this, but I'm sorry. You know, the likelihood is you're not going to be able to become that. You know, it's like saying, okay, I want to become the shortstop of the New York Yankees. I'm going to bust my ass. I'm going to go in the cage and hit baseball after fastball after fastball after fastball. Okay. But, you know, at some point in life, I, I realized that no matter how much I practice, I was never going pro. I was never going pro. You can call me a quitter all you want. If I didn't come to that, determination, I'd probably be on the street corner with a cup right now. Yeah, I got I had a better shot being a bad boy. Exactly. But you know what I mean? Don't, don't get me wrong. You want that determination. You want to be persistent. You want to have the work ethic. But you want to be realistic at the same time. Anyway, off the baseball rant, that's the, the point I'm trying to make here, okay? As difficult as this market looks right now, there is that opportunity. Even if you look for it to take advantage of it in a small way, there's that opportunity, wait for sentiment align and take a shot at something, you know? If we do get that big Bazooka Joe moment where the big buying comes in, then we can get excited and start to talk about some names they're buying, how they look, how the flow looks. Right now, I'm being dead straight with you guys. Unless I have sentiment on my side, I really don't have too much of an interest in any of the action that's out there. And the reason being is the action's not impressing me to begin with. Okay, so what happens is when sentiment lines up, okay, I see, you know, a couple names seeing activity, you know, some signs of buying, maybe I'll take a shot, one of the names, maybe I'll, I want to start swinging an ETF more as long as this correction goes on. You know, so that's, that's the way I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, that's the way um that's the way I'm looking at it. So and right now today I gotta look at everything, especially when everything updates tonight. Um we're pretty much gonna go out, we got went out around neutral-ish, and that's not even too bad considering the reversal yesterday and the gap up today. Very easily, if those gains held or we pushed a little bit more, we could have had a caution, red signal. Out of sentiment today. That wouldn't have shocked me. You know, that wouldn't shock me because of that reversal. These reversals, they give bulls hope. You know, they give bulls hope. All right. Um, the one good thing I will add that I should have thrown in, big picture wise, okay, we're talking about short term because a lot of us are active traders. Big picture wise, there's a lot of negativity out there and bearishness amongst positions out there that I we really have to keep a close eye and be ready for a bottom to form. Doesn't mean it has to, but a lot of the intermediate term indicators, which you guys, we discussed, okay, are really close. Some of them already are flashing bullish signals. Okay, so that's why, I mean, even more important, the two things, you keep your eyes on the flow, and if you keep your eyes on the flow, you're not going to miss the heavy buying that comes in. And when we get those trade opportunities, 
you know, worst comes to worst, the flow's not that impressive. Take a small shot on something to make a little bit of money. Joe will come in, Bazooka Joe's going to come in 2019? I hope so. I hope so. And again, you know, it doesn't mean uh, the market's going to go to new highs. What happens usually, okay, is that we at least get a rally, a sustained rally over the course of usually at the least a couple months where the lows hold, you get a little uptrend, lower, uh, higher lows, you know, that type of thing. Dips start getting bought. We'll start to see flow. You know, right now, what do we see, right? We see um, bull call sweepers come into a flush like yesterday, right? And then all of a sudden, today, they're flipping to the put side already, for Christ's sake. Just like that. Boom. Because they're trading. Okay? What changes when the flow starts, when the quality starts to come in, you'll see them start to buy on the dips. They don't flip to the dark side. They start to buy the dips. We saw it out of this pullback here, if you guys remember. Okay? So we saw something, if you guys remember, like this. See? You had the squeeze action here, rip, and then this pullback, buyers came in there, you know, and you had this sort of thing. You know, does it lead to the start of a whole new leg? Who knows? You know, there's no reason to even occupy our brain cells with that, you know? Take it one step at a time right now, one step at a time, and uh, the first step would be for some of that buying to come in. All right. Um, anybody, let me get to some of your questions because I see questions and I got to scroll back here. Bear with me. Hold on. I got to blow this up so I can see all the questions. This is the problem with me. Hold on. Doesn't let me blow it up. Uh, especially if you guys have any questions on what we discuss here. Baby steps. Yep. That should be our uh, slogan here. Uh, McBob, oh, hold on, McBob. I saw you mentioned the DSI. I'm interested in that. Is that the closing thing today? Let me see. Hold on. Questions. Okay. Uh, McBob saying DSI was 20. Oh, coming into today. Yep. No, today, that's what I'm saying. Today, we're not going to. Um, I Some of the sentiment stuff I looked at today, McBob, actually um, went a bit higher. You know what I mean? Went a bit higher because of the gap up and all. So, I don't think we'll uh, have much of a change there. Yeah, and like McBob's talking about the daily sentiment index, uh, which we look at, which is more of, I would say, in between the shorter to intermediate term time frame. Um, if you remember, we got it down to single digits into the lows. You want to see it under 15, at least, in my opinion. Um, and the likelihood is all the other stuff we look at will all be there. We'll all be there. Uh, George is saying, how do you typically build and size a position? See, that's that's an important question, George. And I see you wrote, you suck at risk management. That's something you're going to have to really go to work on yourself with. Okay. And I know like Steven, um, who's in the room, had posted an interesting um, little risk management thing he goes by, okay? But that may not apply to you. So you, the way you got to look at it, you want the ability to sustain losses, okay? So depending on your account size, obviously you don't want to rely on that one bet. And you know that. But I just repeat it because there are a lot of people who do. Okay, they're worried about that one loser, and if they confront that one loser, they lose interest. Okay, so you obviously got to factor that into equation. You want to be able to absorb some sort of losing streak and still stay the course. And initially, I wouldn't get, I wouldn't focus on how much money are you going to make and is it worth it. That would be the last thing I focus on, George. I'm being honest with you. Until you get a feel for things. And then once you get an understanding a little bit more about yourself and your risk 
and how do you react to that risk, then you can play with the numbers. Then you can always adjust it. The point is you want to get to a point where it almost becomes mechanical. You're not so focused on if this one's going to be a winner or a loser. There's not a whole lot of stress that gets involved in it. You're not going to lose sleep at night. You know, especially options, you know, the beauty of it, if you want to take the approach, you put in what you're willing to lose. So you know what your loss is, worst case scenario, no matter what. And it, it's a lot easier, obviously, when, you know, trying to figure out risk management. But I would, I would just start smaller, you know, I would start lighter and get a feel for yourself as things go on. And I think now is actually a good market to do it. You don't want to do it in the market in 2017, you know, like most retail traders did. Like you would hear um, traders saying, oh, I got two years straight of profitability, baby. Here I come, Jesse Livermore. Guy, you just traded a parabolic move. You know what I mean? Like you probably think you can't lose two straight throwing darts at your charts. So I think this, you know, it's good, and you guys heard me say this, good if you're trying to figure things out in this environment. When I got into the game, I got in in 1998, the Asian contagion. People were leaving the business as I was coming in. I was like, what the hell's going on? I'm getting into the business, everybody's leaving. But it had me get a grasp on risk right out of the gate. You know what I mean? It had me from the start not looking at how much money I was going to make, but how I can grind it out without getting lumped up. So I think this market, you know, it's got some hidden gems in it, being that it's volatile and, and tough, not easy. Uh... Yeah, he posted in the room. I could tell him to post it again if you want, George. Steve, post um post that room in the um in the room again. And then I'll take the link and post it on private Twitter too for some of you guys. Thank you, Mr. Steven. Yeah, and you know, Steven is kind of cut from the same cloth I am. You know, still trying to figure things out, but, you know, he's got some experience. He knows what he's doing. He has an idea, but he's a gambler guy at heart. You know, he loses all his money in the ball games, even though he says he makes money. But, you know, he, you know, he understands this game is gambling, man. He understands this game is gambling. Uh, let's get some other questions here. I'll be saying start with 3% risk of your net liquidity and see how you manage that. All right. So I'll be saying basically, um, he thinks it's a good idea if you start 3% of your account value, basically, right? Of your liquid dollar amount in your account. And, you know, make adjustments as you go on. That's what I tell people. It's, Sizing up, okay, is easy to do once you develop that confidence, okay? Whether you have the money or not, once you have the confidence, you'll find a way to get your hands on the money. So you, you don't, the sizing up stuff and how much money you're making, you don't worry about that um, initially. And I know a lot of times, like when you join a service, you join the steam room, you're paying, so you want to make money. Otherwise, you know, and it, it's easy for me to say. But for me, my experience, and you can ask others, I found that not looking at how much money I was making on each and every trade, you know, going chasing that big dollar amount, those big percentage gains, uh, kept me in check and helped me stick around longer than – I thought I could initially. You know, like, like I'd be saying, you get a feel, and then, you know, you build some confidence, 
you can gradually increase that risk. Yeah, don't Tim is throwing out there, don't get stuck on, on the PL. You, know, you want to kind of like you want to take a big picture approach. Even guys, even some of you who are doing this part-time-ish, you want to take a big picture approach. You guys gotta understand, okay? We've all seen it done, right? MJ, I talk about this. I've been talking about this for two years straight with MJ. A lot of you guys in the room know MJ, okay? You could get hot and go on a run, all right, and turn your 5,000 into 50,000. And if you continue to do the same exact things you're doing, you're going to take that 50,000 back down to 5,000. All right? And at the same token, you can start off with that same 5,000, run into two losers initially, but you manage your risk, you did what you have to do, and in the long run, be a hell of a lot better off than that person that had 5,000% in gains over the first month. You know, when when the market's going well, okay, you're going to make more money. When you're enter a time like this, you're, you're going to grind it out. You're looking to come out of the equation profitable. You, you can't treat each and every climate in this market the same way. You know, you can't just go out there guns blazing and play every stock like it's going, you know, it's going to be a 500% winner. You want to you want to take a big picture approach. That's what anything. That's again, that's the you know, the gambling, the ball games. That's where kind of that made a dent for that mentality for me. Because again, the professional gamblers, you would think, oh, these wise guys, they get in fixed games, right? They never lose. That's the total so far from the truth. Okay, the wise guys, the smart money that bet bowl games and gamble for a living, they're hitting at 60% clips, high 50s. That's what makes them professional gamblers, okay? They know with confidence, no matter what they do today or tomorrow, okay, that over the long run, they're going to hit at a 60% clip. In other words... 60 winners, 40 losers out of 100 games. Okay, once you have the confidence that you can do that, big picture wise, all you got to do is bump up your bet, right? So that's that's where you want to get to. Even as a part-timer, that's where you want to get to. You want to get to the point where you have the confidence that if you stick to what you do, Net, net, you're going to be profitable. And then you can adjust the numbers any way you would like. Uh, what are the questions we got here? Elliot saying, can you talk about the last buy orders posted in the room? Uh, bear risk reversals. I didn't really get to look at the close there, um, Elliot. I did see some um, uh, put sweepers come in towards the bell there. But honestly, Elliot, the flow was sour all day today, even into the green. Um, the better looking action was on the put side. I mean, here, here again, this is if you're on private Twitter, if you're in the room, you hear me complaining about it all day long. Um, but if you're on private Twitter, Jesus, what did I do? If you're on private Twitter and you're trying to get an idea of the flow throughout the day, what I do with this? Oh, Twitter. Hold on. Okay, I forced myself to find a couple bull bets. Okay, this is the top bull bets I put at the end of the day. I rarely put ETF action on here. I had to just to add to the list. Um, It was a big bet, all right? I just wanted to see other flow in some of the other energy ETFs we did. So somebody out there was positioning in the ETFs. I didn't see anything in the names. Schlumberger had some put selling. Um, but XLE, something to keep an eye on. A big sweep there. Okay. Um, foot Locker, this is not even that big of a bet for Foot Locker. You had a Jan sweep. 
and vert. Uh, this is repeat activity. Okay, so this is not even initial activity. And this is actually kind of bearish because it's a play on volatility. We saw this. They were buying this at the start of this correction. All right, so that's some of the initial activity. This is not even initial activity, but some of the activity that caught my eye today are Twitter. Um, that had some action again today, but you guys know Twitter, we're talking about how many days now of the same type of action, right? It's been strong too. You know, you don't want to buy this gap here now, gap up. Uh, Facebook had a little more action today. Facebook we spoke about was the lone bull missile of recent, right? Several of us actually traded it. Um, some tack on action there. You know, there just there wasn't a lot of buying, and it pretty much uh, gave us a good idea of what this day was going to look like. Where's um? Here's some of the other call sweepers. Oh, I should have put this one on there. Not that it matters. I hate the name. Uh, but this was a legit bet. MLCO. That's a casino Macau play. The old MPEL. That was a that was a clean August sweep. Uh, April sweep. I'll add that on private Twitter. That was another. At least it was a legit bet. Some of these things weren't even legit. That's my point. Um, Micron, that was moving some stuff around. Merck, that was a clean bet, but Merck, again, not initial activity. That's one of these defensive names that has been seeing call flow. Strong name. Look at that. Now you got a little dip there. I don't, I don't know what you do with that doesn't excite me too much unless you're interested in the name uh dlph this was uh, some cheap stuff buying there and that's it coke had a lot of put action with it they were adjusting some positions jd some cheap buying you know what i mean cheap crap just normal flow normal flow uh, yeah, Tim was saying go over the VXX call. There was a VXX call buyer. I know that a lot of you were talking about today. I'm, a, you know me, I'm a VXX put sweeper guy, like we saw uh, yesterday. But there was some VXX call buying that you guys were talking about was a good indication of the market. Uh, this guy early in the morning, right? So at basically 1030-ish. Uh, you had some sweeper activity in calls in VXX. Uh, yesterday, a lot of you remember, we had the VXX put activity uh, that signaled to us that a squeeze was in play. You know, a lot of these um, leveraged ETF guys, especially on the put side, they're good, they're solid indicators. You know what I mean? Not even the play. I don't, I don't even play the actual ETF, uh, but it just gives me like a heads up that a squeeze. Like the VXX guy uh, put sweepers, we know. We all know that already. We see that. Um, we start doing cartwheels. Um, but another guy that's been popping up is this SQQQ. And um, yesterday he bought some puts, or was it the day before? Uh, and then usually, you know, he's a little early, and then squeeze flow comes in. So these leveraged ETFs are good indications sometimes of um, flow and a move coming. I never play them. Anybody play? Like, I, I know Rafa played the VXX uh, puts yesterday. I'm sure he did well on those, right? Let me see what they do. Actually, it didn't even come in that much yet. Considering the rally, held up, huh? Yeah, TQQQ, good call, Samir. That's another one, right? When we see uh, sweeper activity in that name, that's usually a good sign. Usually a good sign. You know, and what you usually see too normally is you'll see a bet like what Samir just mentioned in the TQQQ with somebody aggressively will buy some calls. And then it may not be right then and there. 
sometimes later in the day, the next day, you see the flow start to spill over and other things, and it, it confirms it all. Now, sometimes these guys are a little early, um, but it's good. I like them early because they give you the heads up uh, to be on lookout, you know, to be on lookout. So, you know, and th those are some of the key things um, we look at on a day-to-day -day basis, especially when sentiment's there. Like yesterday was a perfect example. All right. Yesterday was a perfect example. Yesterday, you had that selling in the morning. Okay. And you had the VXX put sweeper activity. And then, like I said, the flow wasn't in um, quality, but you had that ETF activity, you had that pace of squeeze action come in. And it was right here. You could see, boom, right off a nine or two. Jesus Christ. So, you know, when they all line up like this, that's when you want to be ready, you know, even on an intraday basis. Like, look at this. You had this niner here. You had VXX put sweeper activity. And then it started to spill over into the flow. I, I really didn't, I didn't, that squeeze, I didn't take advantage of it much. I, I mean, I made a little bit of money, but I didn't, I didn't hit it heavy. I didn't hit it heavy because the names didn't catch action, and I didn't play. The only thing I had was Facebook in the names uh, swing-wise. And that was from the day before? I think so. Anyway, uh, what else we got going on? I think I covered everything, the important stuff anyway. All right? So we know the playbook. We keep it simple. We get We get weakness, upcoming weakness here. The ideal scenario, I'll say it again. I hope I don't jinx it again. Here's the ideal scenario, honestly. We bang our heads down here, okay? Maybe a little lower, maybe a little higher. Who cares? As long as we stay over here and we start to see some good-looking flow come in. Doesn't have to be Bazooka Joe. It could be like that round with Facebook and Goog or the one before that with Amazon and Square. You know, just legitimate call activity in the names that matter and let the market bang around here, reel in some bears and give us the opportunity to at least, you know, position for um, one of these bad boys. All right, but we're going to need, we need that decent flow for, in my opinion, for one of these bad boys and not just a two-day type of thing. Now, uh, what are you guys looking at? Before we run, any names you guys are looking at before we uh, wrap it up? Anything, anybody eyeing? There are some names out there that have been constructive of late. You know what I mean? That have looked decent of late. Uh, but there, there's still a lot of risk in the individual names. You know, there's still a lot of risk. Uh, yeah, like Microsoft, right? Like Microsoft doesn't look that bad for now. You know, what? Uh, what oh, PayPal doesn't look bad. These things actually, this looks like bullish consolidation. So maybe, you know, maybe it's a sign of things to come. There's not a whole lot of names like that, but, um, you know, a little green shoot. Uh, spy puts, you're in spy puts and long PayPal. So that's a nice hedge there, uh, Mandeep. You know, you got spy uh, outperforming to the downside and PayPal holding up. You like that. That's beautiful. That's beautiful right there. You know, MDB. Oh my god, yeah, that is that still up at highs? You gotta be kidding me. Wow. Yeah, some of these names what are uh, data? How's data doing? Look at this. Look at data. You guys see data? Yeah, so there's some names that are Hanging in nice and showing strength. 
Uh, this TTD doesn't catch a lot of flow. Small sweeps, once in a blue moon. Um, I just looked at it today because you have an analyst meeting, I think, tomorrow. But look at this T, like TTD. You know what I mean? This doesn't look bearish. Twitter, yep. Twitter has been looking good. That's been, that's surprised me. I, I didn't play it. I didn't think because of the market and everything else that it would find enough mojo to creep higher out of this. The clouds, it's all cloud. All cloud, huh? And they've been, they were the leaders when shit hit the fan, too. You know what it is? Deep, you got a lot of growth there. They're legit, you know? They're legit. Yep. So it could be they lead us out. We'll see. We'll see. We'll definitely keep our eyes on um I got them all on my screen from the rally. These names were extremely impressive. How about Splunk? Did she come in? Oh, yeah. Came in and bounced them back, Splunk. They don't look that bad, though. You know, they don't look that bad. That's why as, as awful as some of these things look, uh, we got to hang in there, you know? We got to hang in there. What concerns me, okay, these are the green shoots. What concerns me, these banks right now look like, oh, I mean, you can't look much worse than the banks do right now. This KRE, okay, these are the regional, the regional banks, the ETF. These things, they've littered this ETF with put activity. This morning, this thing is up. Ding, 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 opening bell. Right, the market gaps up. The first thing they do is sweep puts in this KRE into green before they even wipe the crust out of their eye. The first thing they did, like look at look at these banks. What is this? Is what is this? I hate to say what this is. This is the C word. That we don't want to talk about. <laughs> That's what this is. You know what I mean? This is not slow down shit. This is the C word. This is the C word. When you see action like this. This is an economic slowdown. They're selling banks at less than book value. Interest rates going lower, Abby, the interest rates were going higher. These things went down even worse. Rates were going higher. These things were accelerating to the downside. Look at this. Right? That's when um, we were worried about that 3% on the yield. Um, listen. You know me, I don't know fundamentals, I don't pay attention to all that stuff, credit, because I'm not smart enough to do so, but from my experience, when you see this type of price action in this space, this is credit, this is, there's something fugazi in the credit markets. You know, maybe it's out of Europe, bank contagion there, there's something, there's something not right. Okay, when you see these names selling like this without a buyer, to, not a bid to be found. Look at this. The machines, you know what? When you see selling like this, the machines smell blood. Okay, in 2008, what happened was similar where the banks, people thought, you know, subprime, it's a little problem just with this bank. The machine smelled blood, and they start attacking all of them. They didn't care if you were involved or not. They just tattooed all of them. And it was just nonstop. Vicious selling. You know, this, this type of price action is not economic slowdown stuff like that. I'm not buying it. You know, I'm not buying it. I could be wrong. But we're already hearing about, you know, 
corporate credit and all that stuff cracks. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 exactly, George. Exactly. Um, you know, the regionals, too, the regional banks acting like that, they don't act like this, do they? Not a buyer to be found? You know, and you look at, like, some of the European banks and all that, they're, uh, they're in disarray. They're abysmal. How about this guy? Before we end it, maybe we got to sacrifice this one to the gods. That's what I was telling McBob today. GE. Somebody just shoot this horse and put her out of a misery already. Maybe that'll put in a bottom. What is this? We got to look at this every day? Do I got to look at put sweepers every single day in this GE? Every day I got to look at it? I got to look at put sweepers playing Jan 2020 $3 puts in GE? Is that what I got to do every day? What's going on with this now? This is a big problem, no? Steven, you remember what I said? It was a prediction I pulled out of my rear end during the heights of the bull market, if you remember. GE will be the death of us. The death of the bull. <laughs> GE brothers. <laughs> he called them G brothers. Oh, God. Uh, Kevin, what are you saying? How does the sweeper tool work in the chat filter? Oh, yeah, yeah. In the room? Like this, Kevin, look. Let me X this out. That's our new spy speedometer. Um, like this. So you open up the filter tab here, and depending on the size of your screen, I guess, um, you know, you can see both. But this way... You don't have to see Steven running his mouth if you don't want to. You know, you could just the uh, just the action here, basically in my commentary. I think that's what you're asking too. Uh, Home Depot still weak, Samir. I haven't looked at that. Let's see. Jeez. Yeah, I mean, listen, outside of those tech names, you got a lot of debacles out there. But what are we going to do? It is what it is. Uh, my email is um, wallstreetjesus at sanglucci. Uh, yeah, Samir, we need, that's what we need. There's no confidence out there. As far as the flow is concerned, there's no confidence. That's why they're playing weeklies. That's why they're being extremely selective. Um, but I'll tell you the good thing, okay? The good thing is it's almost like everybody is waiting for somebody to stick out their neck. That's how it usually happens, okay? So once we see Bazooka Joe show up or once you see those bull missiles flying all around, then – that wakes up the animal spirits. You understand? Nobody wants to stick out, stick their neck out right now. And you can't blame them, okay, when you see bank stocks look like this. You know, Goldman Sachs. I mean, this is Goldman Sachs, folks. This is Goldman Sachs right here. You know, even what we saw in crude. When you get these cascade waterfall type selling events in these things, you know, the, you, you're, the prudent thing to do is step aside, wait, mm -hmm. and there's either a level, a price, or something they have in mind where they're going to step in and think uh, and feel confident that uh, they like to own these things at, at some point. Okay? Maybe lower. Maybe tomorrow. There's no way of knowing. Like I said, the beauty of it, they can't hide it. You understand? They cannot hide it. Even the even the guys going for a squeeze, you know, even the small squ uh, small squeeze sweepers that are just playing 
a squeeze of sentiment. They're not hiding it from me. I know that. You know, they can't hide this. They can't hide this. So when it and then when they come in with the uh with the missiles, obviously they can't hide it. So that's that's what we're gonna keep an eye out for. Yeah, banks are awful. Awful. Banks, home builders, uh well, the casinos finally found the bottom. You got a lot of leveraged groups too that are fighting. Uh, transports, right? Who mentioned the transports? They've been lit up. Yeah, tree the transports, right? Didn't FedEx get lumped up? I mean, this is this is slowdown. Maybe, maybe it's slowdown. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. But for me, when this usually looks like the uh, C word. Yeah, yeah, and that's what happens, Samir. Guys like Cooperman, more of them will show up and f eventually step in. You know, if hopefully before it becomes a you know a contagion, hopefully before it turns into two thousand eight. That's what we're hoping for. But, you know, the overall market, in my opinion, doesn't even do it justice, right? Like, you look at SPY. Like, if I look at a chart of SPY and I had no idea what was going on in the groups that we've all just mentioned, this looks normal to me. This looks like a normal correction to me. You know, under the hood, you got some key groups just rotten at the core, annihilated. But somehow, some way, this overall market, you know, I, I don't know how long they can do it, but they've held they've held it in check here. This looks totally normal. You know, totally normal. I mean, what do what are we uh, ten percent off the high? You no, know, correction status. We can another five percent. It would even be uh, half decent. Give us some more upside room. But we'll see what happens. All right, everybody. Always a pleasure. Enjoy your night. All right. We'll keep a lookout for some uh, from some footprints from big guys. Otherwise, nice and easy. We let the riffraff get all bared up. We look for a snapback squeeze. And we try to survive until the big guys show up. That's basically what we're doing. All right. Be good, everybody.